Professor Peter Piot, thank you for taking the time out and uh, joining us at Medical Festival Asia to really be the keynote for today's session. Welcome to all the attendees uh, logging on for this session. Uh, it is uh, an incredible honor and we sincerely appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to really talk a little bit about the age of pandemics where we are with COVID-19, where we are going as society is living with COVID-19 and, and future epidemics. Um, for those uh, logging in, let me briefly um, provide a bit of a background for Professor Peter Piot. His accolades are, are many and I really could not do justice even in the 45 minutes that we have today. So let me keep it brief by saying he is the director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He was the founding executive director of UNAIDS and undersecretary general of the United Nations. He co-discovered the Ebola virus in Zaire in 1976 and subsequently led pioneering research on HIV, AIDS, women's health and infectious diseases in Africa. Today, he is also the special advisor on COVID-19 research and innovation to the president of the European Commission. And as mentioned, this session today could not be more timely given all of the developments that we have had within this week itself. And a Professor, on a more personal note, and maybe to, to start today's session before I hand it over, we're very happy that you could be with us. And, and the fact that you've also had a personal experience uh, with COVID having, having both um, had it and, and gone through it and uh, come out the other side with the entire spectrum of, of first-hand knowledge beyond just uh, the research and development. So, you know, it, it's, uh, it would be great for our audience to hear a little bit about how that was for you personally from the fear factor to the knowledge that you have gained from someone that would know more about the infectious disease space than, than most others. And um, then I'll pass it to you for introducing yourself and, and the presentation, after which uh, we'll circle back for some of the, the Q&A. So uh, the, floor, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Varun, and uh, good uh, afternoon, um, good evening, good morning, wherever you are, everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure to uh, to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And indeed, when I um, uh, accepted the invitation, when you asked me to speak now, I couldn't have thought that we were in, a, a pro hopefully, a turning point in some historic days that in terms of the fight against the COVID-19, because um, as you may have uh, uh, read or seen or heard uh, yesterday uh, in the UK, the first person was uh, vaccinated uh, as part of against COVID-19 as part of a, a new, um, you know, rollout of vaccine uh, for, you know, public health. It was a 91 year old woman. So uh, someone who was in the most vulnerable age um, for dying from COVID-19. But we still have a long way to go. And uh, it's certainly not an exaggeration to say that uh, with COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we are uh, in many parts of the world facing the um, most severe uh, crisis in peacetime uh, with an impact not only in people's lives, but also on the economy and livelihoods, on businesses, on just name it, on everything. Yeah. And what I'll do is to uh, give a brief overview of epidemics, where are we uh, from, uh, coming from, and can I have the next slide? And, and it's, it should be clear that the, um, what we call emerging infectious diseases, so these are infectious diseases that either did not exist or that come and go, um, have been part of uh, human history for all, always, particularly since we became sedentary, since we, from nomads to, um, you know, to organize in villages and then in, uh, uh, in, in cities and so on. And uh, I won't go in detail of this, but just to illustrate, this is a, um, a fairly uh, Eurocentric type of uh, uh, list here, um, where you can see that pandemics were already well documented, uh, such uh, in, in ancient histories, such as the plague of Athens, uh, you know, before, uh, you know, our uh, Christian age, uh, we also um, have uh, reports from uh, thousands of years ago from China about pandemics and so on. So every um, part of the world has had its pandemics. 
and some have been going on for thousands of years, such as the plague. Um, we've had then the appearance of uh, syphilis, of tuberculosis, and so on. And then regularly, uh, we all uh, facing um, influenza, flu uh, demics. And the biggest of all was uh, about 100 years ago, the so-called Spanish flu, although it had nothing to do with Spain, but uh, we tend to always blame other countries for our problems. Um, and that really um, uh, killed uh, well over 50 million people uh, at a time when our total population on this planet was uh, less than 2 billion, I mean 1.7 billion. So that is uh, only like one uh, fourth, uh, one third of um, what we are now and killed more people than in, um, in, in the whole of World War I, which was particularly devastating in, uh, in Europe and the Middle East. Um, now, um, in more recent years, uh, we've seen, uh, you know, in epidemics such as Ebola uh, coming up, uh, HIV, which is the, the biggest of all uh, in modern times, with uh, killed already uh, over 37 million people, but it's uh, continuing in a quite a stealth way. We had SARS affecting the region particularly, um, and um, swine flu, uh, etc. Can I have the next slide? And um, so that's the first thing. It is part of our, um, you know, history and our human condition, and I'll come back to that later. Secondly, um, the um, myself, as you could hear, I was involved from the early days that the, uh, on in the discovery of uh, Ebola virus, or as part of that team of uh, Congolese, American, Belgian um, uh, researchers, and. Um, uh, since then, that was in 1976, and uh, since then there have been sporadic outbreaks in the middle of, uh, of Africa, and we thought that this was limited to Central Africa because the virus reservoir, where the virus happily lives uh, in basically in harmony with bats, was limited to Central Africa until in 2014 uh, in West Africa in three countries, Sierra Leone, Liberia, um, and um, Guinea, Conakry, um, we had the largest Ebola outbreak ever with 11,000 deaths. Um, so that illustrates also that these epidemics can move. But it did not give rise to a worldwide pandemic, pandemic meaning the whole world, because it requires very close contact and it's not transmitted by air, just as uh, like uh, respiratory, um, as uh, is the case with influenza or uh, SARS or uh, now COVID-19. Can I have the next uh, slide, please? Um, and we, we've been seeing an increase in um, uh, infectious disease, emerging infectious diseases, and uh, epidemics uh, in recent years, recent decades, I should say. And there is a good reason for that. And the, the reason is really, if I may summarize it, is that our failure to live in harmony with nature. Um, because uh, what they have in common uh, is that they all are so-called zoonoses. They come from uh, other animals, and uh, I'll come back to that uh, in a minute. Uh, but what we're seeing is, of course, a, a population that is uh, increasing. Uh, population growth is uh, continuous, although at a much slower pace than, uh, than ever before. Um, that increases the pressure on nature. Uh, urbanization, same thing. Uh, we're much more mobile. What used to be a local event is now in no time becomes a, uh, a regional or a global uh, a problem. Um, you know, when you consider how fast um, uh, viruses can fly, can, uh, that's as fast as people fly. And, um, and that's a big difference with 100 years ago with the Spanish flu when there was no commercial airfare, air travel. And uh, now, of course, it's uh, very different. We have examples when you think of the region of um, MERS in, from the Middle East, a uh, uh, businessman flying from the Gulf to Seoul in, in Korea and, uh, and causing an epidemic there. We had SARS and then someone uh, moving from um, Hong Kong to Toronto in Canada and causing an outbreak there, et cetera, et cetera. We now the virus, the current one, started most probably in Wuhan, in Hubei province and then spread all over the world. This is not to blame anybody, but that's how life is today. Climate change is going to increase our risks. 
And um, for many reasons. Um, one reason being that because of climate change, um, mosquitoes, other insects, uh, can uh, thrive in far more places than before. And why is that important for diseases? Because some uh, uh, of these infections uh, are being transmitted through mosquito bites. Thinking particularly here of dengue, very well known in the region. We had a Zika epidemic, um, chikungunya, yellow fever. And um, so that means, <clears throat> sorry, that means that the, the range, the geographic range is gonna expand. But also because of climate change, we have extreme weather events and that will lead to inundations and so on. And uh, also um, a, uh, an increase in waterborne diseases and so on, plus pressure on nature again. Conflict is always a, a um, you know, uh, a source of uh, outbreaks because of a collapse of the health system and of sanitation. Poverty continue and is a, a big um, driver and it's the poor people who are the most easily affected by these dynamics. Deforestation um, plays a role and um, because we, we invade the habitat of uh, animals uh, carrying these viruses and then the food production also plays a role um, because it's of global nature and, and increases and it's very intense. So these uh, huge uh, poultry farms or pig farms and all that can be sources also for rapid spread of uh, viruses. Next one, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so that's why I am um, talking about the age of pandemics and um, where you see it all uh, coming together here on the left side, these three, you know, the interaction between us humans, the environment and animals. And that leads to the concept of what we call One Health. In One Health, we don't only uh, think of us humans are our health, but also uh, we need to monitor and take good care of the health of other animals and of the planet. And that's then planetary health. And uh, so what they have all in common, as I mentioned, is that they are um, zoonoses. These are infections in humans that originate in um, animals. And it happens all the time that viruses are transmitted from uh, animals to, to humans. But in most cases, nothing bad happens. Uh, at the most, one individual may have some problems. But uh, when the virus adapts, and then can spread to others, that's when we run into problems like HIV uh, originated in chimpanzees. Uh, bats are notorious for, um, as a reservoir for coronaviruses, for Ebola, uh, and then for influenza, we have a whole range of um, animals that can be the source, particularly uh, all types of birds, but it also pigs and that are, uh, you know, and when there is transmission to people, then uh, we are running into problems. And it's not only because people would consume the meat or the, you know, the, uh, yeah, the proteins that are in the environment they're living in, but also, um, as I said, through highly concentrated husbandry and, um, and other ways with, through intermediary uh, hosts. Can I have the next slide? And um, the, um, when it coming to uh, coronaviruses, because that's what's on our mind now, um, some groundbreaking research has been done in China and other countries um, and out of the University of Hong Kong and, uh, and Chinese universities. Um, and uh, researchers um, uh, like, um, you know, Ben Hu uh, identified and found um, SARS uh, type of viruses in um, horseshoe bats. And in one single case in Yunnan province in southern China, uh, they found like 11 new strains of this virus in just in one cave. That gives you an idea how common these coronaviruses uh, are. And, um, and it's in the, in the bats that they are uh, rearranging their gen genetic material. Um, in other words, their identity, and sometimes they're becoming then really risky for, for humans. And, uh, and in that same, um, you know, uh, cave, they found then other viruses, uh, coronaviruses. And so for SARS, that's well established. In the case of COVID-19, uh, we still don't know where exactly it came from, but one day 
and fine, but it could be a, uh, you know, um, a chance um, uh, finding. It's, it's, uh, it's not so easy to, uh, to identify that. Um, so this is where we are, next slide, where we are with the, uh, the fact that um, we are um, part of the, you know, of the planet, and that means also of the viruses that are infecting kinds of animals. Now, um, COVID-19. So about a year ago, the first cases uh, uh, appeared, first known cases in uh, uh, Wuhan, uh, in China, Hubei province. Um, and in the meantime, there are officially 67 plus uh, million uh, confirmed cases. But the true number of cases is probably about 100 times higher. Uh, sorry, uh, 10 times higher. Um, this is from The Economist. And uh, they are uh, they estimated uh, that there may be about 600 million plus uh, people who had become infected with, um, with this virus. And in terms of deaths, we're probably closer to 2 million than to the 1.5 million officially as reported as of um, uh, yesterday. And um, next slide, please. So this is uh, affecting all continents. And I'll come back there um, in a minute because there are also regional differences. Um, yeah, as uh, you alluded to, Varun, uh, I, um, you know, got infected myself in, in, uh, in March. Uh, how and from whom, I don't know. Uh, I have a pretty active life and give a lot of talks, ironically, about um, epidemics, COVID-19. And the title of my talk uh, before this epidemic was, Are We Ready for the Next Pandemic? And I've given that also in the region several times. And the, uh, the answer to that question was no, unfortunately. And uh, so some people like, uh, you know, in my field, we've been saying this is going to happen. Uh, when, we don't know. Uh, it's a bit like in Silicon Valley or in, in California, they know that one day there will be the big one. And the big one in California is a big earthquake because they are at the part of the, uh, you know, of the earth where there are tectonic plates, which will cause at some point a major um, you know, earthquake. It can be tomorrow, it can be, uh, you know, in a hundred years, but, we, but they have to prepare, like it, through construction um, standards, etc. Now, uh, COVID-19 is not only an acute infection, and most people actually have only a, a mild uh, influenza type of uh, uh, disease, illness, or are asymptomatic, but the older you get, particularly over 65, uh, the more the risk that you have develop severe disease and uh, overall mortality is then close to 1%, which is a bit higher than from influenza. But if you're, let's say, 80 or so, that, uh, uh, that uh, mortality risk is much, much higher. However, what we didn't know uh, until fairly recently is something that I also suffered from and is so-called long COVID-19. One, we've learned that the virus is not only a respiratory virus, I mean, it's, it's transmitted through exhaling through the air uh, and inhaling, um, and so affecting the lungs uh, that we knew, but it affects and invades every single cell in the body. The brain is affected, the heart, the joints, the skin, the kidneys, um, and so people can experience a, for months and months a, um, yeah, what's called long COVID with uh, extreme fatigue, um, heart problems, uh, insomnia, um, headaches, brain fog, as they say, um, etc. Some end up on, um, you know, in renal dialysis and so on. So that's something fairly new and uh, we need to understand because it may affect, can I have the next slide, um, about five um, to even 10 percent, depends on the age group of people who have acute um, COVID-19. And interestingly, it can also affect if you had, <clears throat> you, if you had a fairly mild infection and, uh, and if you're younger. And we don't really know yet how to manage this. And this is going to be a major burden on individuals, but also on the healthcare systems. Now, this uh, epidemic uh, is going to have an impact for years to come. So good news that 21 is going to be a better year than 2020, I'm quite sure, thanks to vaccines and all the measures that have been taken. But this is from the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board, which issued a report and showed that um, you know, there will be huge impacts on health outcomes beyond COVID-19, because 
in many countries, the health system has not been able to uh, deal with um, other issues um, from cancer to uh, chronic and uh, cardiac and uh, cardiovascular and infections, uh, uh, diseases and, uh, um, and diabetes and so on. Um, so it has pushed people into poverty as often, um, you know, crisis and pandemics, they um, not only expose the fault lines in society, but they also increase uh, inequalities and they affect uh, the, um, the poorest, the ones that are most vulnerable in the uh, hardest way. Growing food insecurity, children have been out of school. What does that mean for later? Mental health issues, social cohesion in many countries uh, is there and also even political problems. So we're, we're going to have a major impact for years to come. And also uh, many countries, many governments have in, uh, are in huge debts, such as um, some companies. Others have, uh, companies have made a lot of money. It's all this, uh, um, two sides on the coin. Um, can I have the next slide? Now, sometimes you hear the debate whether, um, you know, we need to choose for public health or for, um, you know, um, or for dealing with the, the economy. But that's a false uh, dichotomy. This is a, um, a figure from the Financial Times. And uh, it shows that those countries that have done the best in terms of dealing with the epidemic and had the least deaths uh, here in deaths per million, um, that they also had a, um, you know, the least of a economic uh, hit uh, as compared to countries that have done uh, rather poorly in terms of the number of deaths because that's where the, um, you know, the, um, then the impact on the economy was highest. So we need, in order to save the economy, we need to save the people and to uh, control the epidemic. That's now very clear. Next slide. So. Now, in general, um, certainly uh, East and Southeast Asia have done much better than, um, the, than Europe and, uh, uh, and North America, uh, the US particularly. Um, when you look here at the curves, the, the blue is, um, you know, dark blue is the EU and the uh, light blue is the US with the, um, not only the number of deaths, but also number of cases. And in um, the two reds are, red and orange are East Asia and Southeast Asia. And um, it's something that fascinates me in the sense that um, every country applies or tries to apply the same measures. You know, there are not 1500 ways of dealing with this epidemic. Uh, it's social distancing, wearing masks, um, uh, hygiene, um, you know, uh, testing and tracing, isolating cases and so on. So it's pretty up to the, the fact or to the time that we have a vaccine, uh, quite um, primitive in, when you think of it, just the same as we did 100 years ago. Um, and yet these measures have worked um, quite well in, uh, in most of Asia, uh, I should say less so in South Asia, um, and, um, and not in, um, you know, in Europe or in, um, yeah, in, in, in the US in, and in Latin America. Uh, so in a sense, Western societies probably through their culture um, are less well prepared to deal with these epidemics because it requires a real community spirit and respecting the rules of the game. And, and in other words, that your personal behavior really contributes to the collective security. And that seems to be more of a problem in uh, Western societies than in Southeast and East Asia. Oh, next one. And the, um, yeah, next, well, what brings the future us? is from a famous Belgian painter, Mar Magritte. Um, well, will this be become endemic? Uh, endemic means that it will be with us for, yeah, always, so such as HIV has become endemic. And I'm not going to go into the details of this uh, complex slide, but that will depend on many factors. For example, uh, how long, uh, when we're infected, will we be protected? Is immunity going to be there for one year, five years, 10 years? And will be the same for when we vaccinate it. How long will the protection be? So that will be a, a major in, um, you know, determinant. Um, and whether there will be a seasonality, uh, particularly in uh, uh, countries where there is more of a winter season and a, and a, and a colder and a, 
um, and a warmer season because viruses behave with different and people spend more time inside, etc. So this is a an unknown yet. Uh, next slide, and it it will depend uh, also on how effective the vaccine is. That brings me to the vaccine. All and and has been, I must say, um, unprecedented again. The uh, silver lining on this epidemic that has been fantastic collaboration among nations, uh, among disciplines, industry, uh, academia, um, and major investments uh, in the development of products, but particularly vaccines. If you look at vaccines in, through history and vaccines, let's not forget, are still saving every year millions of lives, literally, not only for children, but also in older age. And that, you know, you see here that it takes on the average about 10 years before, be, between the first uh, studies in small animals in the lab laboratory and um, the rollout of a um, virus. And only one um, virus has ever been eradicated, uh, human virus, and that is smallpox. We're getting close to polio, but we're not there yet. Uh, it's been going on for a while. Next slide. And um, vaccines are, um, you know, as a, in other words, our main tool to prevent um, infectious disease, including pandemics. And will a vaccine now end this pandemic? And here, uh, I'd like to go through very um, uh, briefly uh, about five things, the five conditions. One is, will the, vir will the vaccine uh, work? Will it be e effective? And um, there, the good news is that for COVID-19, it looks like they can be highly effective. And I'll give some figures later on. Then the question is for how long, as I mentioned, will this protection last? Will it work in all um, age groups, for example, in, for everybody? Um, that's, so that's the first question. And that question can only be answered through um, randomized controlled trials, phase three trials, as you know, um, involving tens and tens of thousands of people. Secondly, will it be safe? Hugely important because we're injecting biological materials in healthy people and um, in this case, probably billions of people. So we must be absolutely sure that this is not gonna uh, you know, cause major side effects. Um, and again, that has to be uh, you know, observed and studied in uh, large population-based trials. Thirdly, let's assume it works, it's safe. We need billions of um, products. And that is uh, um, also unprecedented. Um, and the uh, production capacity is simply not there, but there the good news again is that thanks to massive investments, again, from the private sector and from governments um, and foundations, trusts like uh, the Gates Foundation, for example, um, means that um, that capacity is being beefed up. And, and I think we will get there in uh, 21 and certainly by 22. And that's where um, Asia can play a big role. Uh, we already know that, for example, that uh, India is a, a major producer of vaccines, just as from uh, generic uh, drugs, but also China and other countries in the region, uh, I, I expect will um, you know, become the world's manufacturers for, for vaccines, uh, which they already are, but also for COVID vaccine. Uh, fourth one is then, uh, we have to distribute it. We have to put in place a system. Many countries have good uh, immunization programs, but they are, um, you know, targeted to children. This is about adults and even older adults. So we need to put in place other systems. And then is the, the, the question, the tricky question, who gets first um, and who comes first? Because uh, it's of course not possible that uh, let just after approval, uh, overnight, there are billions of doses um, available and that, that can be organized. So this is a tricky question. And uh, in, in general, countries have said we will go first for healthcare workers, those who are work with, working with um, elderly in home, in home care, for example, care, um, care homes, and uh, also uh, the elderly, the most vulnerable. And then finally, will people accept it? You see here on the map um, a, from a, a worldwide survey and um, in red, the, the darker the red uh, shows that the skepticism for um, uh, to, to accept uh, vaccines, and uh, and there is a growing 
movement, I would say, of vaccine hesitancy, people who are on the one hand, in some people who are against vaccines in general, but then others who ask questions about uh, vaccines for COVID. Um, next slide. The good news is, and this is from a website of the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine, where we are following closely the development uh, of the vaccine. It's, the, it's an, an update, a weekly update. Um, and there are uh, over 270 uh, vaccine candidates in the pipeline at various uh, stages of development and, uh, and, and different platforms, uh, which is also good and new because we have different approaches to um, tackle this virus, which means that we have a better chance of being successful. Next slide, please. Um, and um, here there are uh, 11 uh, candidate vaccines uh, who are that are in um, phase three. So phase three, where you try to find out the efficacy. And often it's 30,000, 60,000 um, participants. And um, the, uh, you see that they're, they're from um, Europe, from um, the US, from China, uh, Russia. Um, and uh, uh, again, this is uh, unprecedented to organize it in less than a year instead of like 10 years. Um, and can I have the next one, please? Um, and here there are a number of uh, vaccines that are either have uh, already announced um, efficacy data uh, with, um, um, with, the ex with press releases usually, except now yesterday was a paper come in the Lancet uh, from the, um, you know, the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is called here Oxford, but it's AstraZeneca. Um, and um, and the, uh, they're suggesting that the, the two vaccines that are based on messenger RNA, the Pfizer um, BioNTech uh, vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, uh, showing efficacy that is more than 90% protection against disease, illness. Um, and that's really uh, so hope giving and was beyond my and other experts uh, expectations. Um, We've had press releases also of the efficacy of, uh, uh, you know, uh, CanSino and uh, Sinovac uh, vaccines. Uh, uh, one uh, are, um, you know, the CanSino is along the same platform or similar platform as the uh, AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine and the uh, Janssen vaccine. And then the Janssen vaccine I, I put in here also because it is requiring most probably only one dose instead of um, two doses. There's a big trial going on. Uh, so that is, uh, uh, should come out also quite soon. Um, next slide. So, and that then um, led to uh, yesterday, as uh, I mentioned, the uh, first um, yeah, public health use of a vaccine, which is a real uh, milestone. Um, of course, the media made already that said that this is V-Day. Um, vaccine day um, and that's being rolled out now in the UK although with limited uh, supplies uh, so it will take months before everybody who needs it will get it next slide and so and what do we need what uh, percentage of the population has to be um, you know um, vaccinated in order to protect the whole of society so so-called herd immunity and um, um, we don't know exactly, but to make a long story short, um, it's probably going to be around 70%. That means that we need to vaccinate 70%, between 60 and 80% of um, the population to protect everybody. That changes from uh, um, infection to infection. Like for measles, it's uh, very high. It's like 93% minimum. If you go below that, then you have epidemics. For others, like pneumococcal pneumonia, it can be like 50%. Here, It'd be very important that we uh, vaccinate the percentage of the population that's needed to protect everybody to go back to normal. That's why also dealing with vaccine hesitancy is so important because if because of that, um, you know, we drop from let's say a coverage of 70 percent to 60 percent, uh, then we're all in trouble. So it's not just for the individual, but it's vaccines are there also for a society as a whole. Next slide. A big issue is. Um, access to all who need it, not only the wealthy countries, because, um, and, and that's, there are lots of uh, initiatives, I won't go into detail there, and uh, Asian countries are a part of that from the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation and the uh, COVAX, the 
uh, an initiative that came from, um, you know, originally from uh, the European Union, uh, but now with CEPI and Gavi and the World Health Organization and UNICEF all working together to make sure that there is equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines. We are not there yet. There's still a need for billions and uh, of, um, you know, of dollars or whatever currency, but also uh, to uh, make sure that there is enough vaccine manufacturing. But again, there's a lot going on and, uh, and that's the good news. And then um, near the end, um, can I have the next slide? Since I'm a special advisor to President Ursula von der Leyen and the President of the European Commission, um, we've been extremely active, uh, not only on the vaccine end, but also in trying to uh, have a European type of response because viruses know no borders. They don't need a passport, a visa or whatever. So you need an approach that is at least regional and uh, so uh, there's been a lot of uh, going on in terms of cross-border threats, uh, how to manage that. And it was a major part of her State of the Union address in September. And we're building also a special agency to develop uh, uh, for the development of new products against future um, pandemics. Uh, and there will be a global health summit with the G20 and uh, chaired by Italy then and the EU in uh, May 21. And then I mentioned already the work on COVAX. And final slide, I think we need to um, have two things in mind. Um, one, that is that uh, we should think of societies living with COVID-19. Even with a vaccine, we have to, uh, we don't know yet, for example, that the vaccine prevents also transmission, not only disease. Uh, and we'll have to uh, adapt our norms. Uh, on the right upper hand side here, you see, and this is from the Japanese schoolgirls. Uh, just after the Spanish flu. And it's during the Spanish flu that the, um, the etiquette, the, the norm of wearing a mask when you have a cold and dripping nose or whatever to protect others has started. And that is uh, far more common, of course, in East Asia, Southeast Asia than in the rest of the world. We need to adopt that, uh, you know, that behavior everywhere. Uh, and so we'll need to uh, really strengthen also um, our public health institutions and there in Southeast Asia, particularly East Asia, uh, the SARS epidemic led to strengthen um, public health institutions, contact tracing and so on. Uh, we should do the same thing in the rest of the world. Now, this is a big wake up call. Continue to invest in research and innovation and um, change the way we live, work, travel, interact with nature. And, and that's a big issue that we have. So there's no time to lose, as is the title of my biography, because one thing is sure, we must get ready now already for the next big one, the next big pandemic. Thank you so much for listening to me and over to you, uh, Varun. Thank you, thank you, Professor Piot. That, that was uh, extremely insightful and obviously touched upon a, a lot of points in terms of where we are, how we got here, the One Health concept is, I think, something that we should all take to heart and uh, really follow that holistic approach, just, you know, living in, in balance. Um, but looking at really going forward in, in the future, we've had quite a few questions come in in, in the chat. So maybe I can uh, kind of group these across vaccine access uh, side effects and essentially kind of going forward in the, the trust elements and touch upon these briefly in the next 10, 10, 10 15 minutes. Um, so I guess just to, to begin with, in terms of the vaccine, there has been an expedited rollout. It's taken roughly uh, one year to get this out there versus a, a two, three, five, ten year uh, alternative that has been the case. That's obviously caused a few questions around, is it safe and, and the trust elements that are around it. Um, I guess two questions related to that would be, can pharma or is there means which pharma can share the information, their research to assist with this um, kind of research and development and rollout process? And two, how has this expedited approach been taken without really impacting the quality of the vaccine? Has it been the clearance of red tape? Has it been the deployment of resources? How, how have we gotten here or has that behind the scenes pharma collaboration been happening? Yeah, no, well, that's a really important question because uh, you wonder, you know, why, uh, what takes normally 10 years? Why could we do this in uh, one, uh, one year? And I, I think, first of all, um, in terms of the uh, 
testing of the vaccines the, uh, for efficacy, certainly that no shortcuts have been taken that I can see. Um, and also the regulators are uh, applying the same uh, rigorous standards for, you know, but there are many in, unanswered questions, as I said, um, which normally, uh, which can only be answered by over time is how long will the protection last? We know these the vaccines that I mentioned, they are highly protective, but that is with a follow-up of a few months. But uh, a year from now, will the same people be still protected? Only time will tell us, and that's why um, it is really important to have uh, what post-marketing surveillance, close monitoring of everybody who's been, in, and that has been rolled out by the companies, but also uh, by governments in, uh, I know certainly in, the, in, in, in Europe, but I, I think I understand will also be the case in Asia. Um, right. on, on, uh, and then so um, uh, will they be as effective in uh, specific vulnerable subgroups? So that requires yeah, further study. On the, on the safety, again, we can say no shortcuts. And with the um, two months after the last vaccination, that has been the cutoff that the FDA and um, EMA have said, uh, that um, we can say absolutely safe. However, the long-term safety on when we start inoculating millions of people, again, that's something we need to be honest about that. That's something that we need to um, to monitor. Now, the good news is that, um, you know, nearly all uh, serious uh, adverse events for vaccines, they occur very early on. But in, in, in order to make sure it's absolute safety, yeah, you need to follow. That's why the authorization in, uh, in the UK was an emergency one and uh, an emergency authorization, which I think is going to be the same uh, that will be used a similar approach in the US. In, and in Europe, we will go for what's called provisional marketing authorization which means that the product is under very close scrutiny. Um, so I, I think that the quality, yeah. and why is it not possible to go, well, indeed, red tape has been cut, so that should be a lesson in that in the future, there's no excuse to have this red tape for other products, that's how I see things. But also, um, because there's been a simultaneous approach, massive investment, money was not a problem. And so while, um, for example, while, um, phase one trials started, they were already planning for the phase three trials, uh, not starting them because you need the results first, uh, but so that the day that you have the, the results of phase one and it looks good, you start with phase two, phase three. Um, so within a week, that's uh, what happened. Um, also um, manufacturing uh, investments uh, were already uh, you know, started from before they had any idea whether it would work or not. So, uh, but that's a kind of risks because they're a huge risk for a company. That's why the government in uh, public money was needed. You can't take that for every time because normally you wait until, okay, let's find out if it's work or not. Because the, uh, you know, the success rate of vaccine development is also less than 10%. So a company can't just do that normally. So this is uh, because of the extraordinary um, urgency extraordinary measures were taken, but uh, it is only because the public sector also came in. And then the, we, let's not forget, we're building on decades of uh, basic research of development. Um, for example, these new vaccines, the Pfizer, BioNTech and the Moderna, they're based on a totally new technology, messenger RNA, never a product on the market, but that's the result of a few decades. That didn't, that type of research also the with the adenovirus platform, <clears throat> that did not start a year ago. That started like 20 years ago. Right. I mean, I think the just the breadth and the depth of impact that COVID has had, I think it's only been matched uh, by the inspiration of essentially the entire community and the industry is just coming together to, to tackle the problem. Um, when you were touching on vaccines and really the close monitoring, the provisional marketing element of it, do you or should we as the consumer and the public expect that different vaccines may have different side effects or be for different audiences? So you mentioned which population demographics. So just uh, yesterday, Pfizer had a release that their vaccines showed better positive results where the successes for the, the success percentage was equal regardless of pre-existing conditions in terms of diabetes and other underlying diseases, which is very promising. Is that something that should be expected or will that vary 
vaccine to vaccine? Well, to be honest, most experts um, expected the lower efficacy of these vaccines, so we were wrong. Um, so, and, uh, um, and we were and particularly worried about the, the elderly because we know that, for example, influenza vaccines uh, show a lower efficacy in those over 70 and 80. You need higher doses and so on. Um, so that's is good news. Uh, everything we do now is new. And that's uh, from a scientist. As a scientist, I would say that's exciting. Uh, from, a, let's say, public health perspective or pharma, that's a worrisome. And so you need to go through it. Um, but your point is very important. And that is the fact that we will need uh, multiple vaccines because it may be that vaccine A works better for the elderly than vaccine B, that vaccine C um, has more impact on the transmission, not so much on disease. So it could be that we go to combinations of vaccines and in general, I would say that the um, logistics are going to be very important. Transport, like the, you mentioned, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine right. requires minus 70 uh, preservation and, and, and transport. That's quite a, a logistic uh, challenge. It's not impossible, eh? but uh, we've been doing it in, 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 in Congo for a Merck vaccine against Ebola. But it adds to the complexity. And compared to a vaccine, you can just... Uh, transport and, and preserve in the fridge. And, uh, and then one injection versus two injections. That is, uh, if the Janssen vaccine works with one injection, the manufacturing I think that, is yeah, that will be a huge advantage. Um, to logistic. get the doses out, meet the population. Yes. For, for yeah. the logistics, just asking, or maybe if you could uh, answer that, why is it that certain vaccines require a, a certain condition, which is very difficult logistically, versus others that are friendly? Is it access or information between pharma, or simply different techniques that are used on, on the cell level and the type of vaccine, the RNA? Um, why would that be? Yeah, it's the latter, the no, yeah, the latter. So, because uh, RNA, uh, so that's uh, nucleic acids, that's uh, very fragile. Uh, and the way it's packaged in the way that the BioNTech uh, has de developed this with Pfizer um, means that it's extremely fragile and uh, uh, that um, uh, once it's uh, no longer uh, frozen, you have to administer it uh, within a certain period of time. Uh, whereas for the adenovirus platforms, like the one that uh, AstraZeneca and uh, uh, Janssen are using, uh, it is, uh, that's more stable. Uh, so it is, yeah, they're, they're working on it, I'm sure, for RNA, because Moderna already has uh, a, a product that is more stable at a, with higher temperatures. So this, this means that the, um, this is the first generation of vaccines. And it uh, right. would be unusual that the first generation is the optimal generation of products. So the, there will be a need for vaccine development further and further, because this is such a global problem. How do you balance that in terms of getting the risk level that is there in the population today uh, with the logistical requirements? With yourself seeing the UK having V-Day yesterday, how do you see the UK responding? Because are there preferences in certain countries for certain vaccines? Do you think there'll be a consolidated effort to roll it out pan-EU and hopefully overseas? What is that process going to look like? Yeah, it's uh, at the moment a bit on first come, first serve basis from first what you can get, but uh, in uh, as a case in the UK, but um, there will be uh, hopefully as the results uh, become available, um, the, uh, you know, there will be more licensed and then, and then I think it'll be on the basis particularly of not only efficacy, probably let's assume they're all more or less the same, but on um, price and logistics and so on. Uh, in Europe, there is a coordinated approach. Uh, so the EU, but uh, you know, there's Brexit, so the UK is no longer part of it. Um, and there, um, we there are, uh, as I mentioned uh, briefly, um, advanced market commitments and and and, and uh, procurements uh, for all European member states. And um, there is a more coordinated plan. Uh, let's put it this way. Um, and. Um, and there is enough for all citizens, but there also, uh, interestingly, there's procurement also done for low income countries so that there is equitable access, because that's one of my main concerns that there is enough uh, for everybody in the, in the whole world. And um, so, but uh, the, 
um, there's still a lot of uncertainty. So we'll have to see uh, when we meet again in a few months' time. I should be able to answer this uh, more clearly. <laughs> No, um, I mean, obviously there's a lot of unknowns and assumptions that we're working with. Um, building on the access point, I know there's a, a WTO discussion tomorrow where MSF access is talking about or trying to push the relaxing of IP around COVID. Um, and of course you're mentioning COVAX. Uh, essentially, when you're talking about distribution, go to market, there's a cost element, the price element, there is an element of who takes that burden and risk and, and potential hazards, the liability. But leaving that aside for a minute, if you just look at the access, how is the response being around relaxing IP? Because obviously the research has taken a lot of investment, but this is a public good or public need. Um, what is the conversation happening around that? Because this will obviously then likely move on to India, China, development, manufacturing, scale, where countries have this ability to, to scale up if they're allowed and IP is relaxed. Yeah, no, it is a debate I'm quite familiar with because I worked a lot on access to antiretroviral um, medication to drugs for against HIV, where um, in the uh, 1990s, um, only people in high income countries had uh, access to life-saving drugs for, for HIV infection. And so, uh, but, uh, I, and, and that took about 10 years um to to in, ensure that access here we're in a much better position first of all a few companies um like uh, astrazeneca and j and j have said that they will sell this at uh, uh, no profit i mean just cost plus bit um basis but also um i think that uh, to be honest uh, knowing uh, about the uh, how complex vaccine development is i don't think that ip is the big issue to be honest, I think it's a bit of a false debate. It's like you have all the IP to make a Boeing plane. Yeah, so what, you know, the, the, the steps are, it's, it's a, you know, particularly the quality, ensuring consistency, consistent high quality between batches at a large scale. It sounds very technical, but that is not so much IP. It's kind of more know-how and, um, and when you look at my, when you look at where where are most vaccines in the world made now today, uh, I mean there is some Western companies, but it's in India. I mean when you have Serum Institute, Biological E, and these are now world class facilities. It took years to um, build that kind of uh, you know expertise, and I visited them. And when you look at you know what is the biggest building in in a vaccine plant, it's the Quality Assurance Building quality right and, and uh and process so, controls process flows so ip may be a role but i think most of this ip is uh, and how to make a, the 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 basics of the vaccine that you can read in in uh, scientific newspapers and journals but it's the yeah the nitty-gritty i don't know it's like cooking it's not when you have a recipe book recipe. i love cooking so that the result will be as good as from a, of a famous chef and um in the case of vaccines, we cannot do less than the famous said. So I'm not against that debate at all whatsoever, but I think that the issue for the me is more- Primary issue is production, there's other areas I that think really so. solve. Yes, yes, and collaboration there, tech transfer uh, agreements, and, um, and I think that is happening al already. And then making sure that, you know, the, the price is also uh, a fair price. I mean, I, you know, companies have to make profit, no problem with that, but it has to be at a, you know, at a level that Access. nobody will be denied, denied the vaccine because of the price. And that's where governments have to come in also, of course. And I guess uh, building on that for equitable access with these different vaccines and technology transfers, is that how you envision both reaching the scale required, but also reaching areas that are rural, unable to get, uh, and don't have the basic infrastructure? Reaching that will be a difficult problem because like you said, if it's only as good as the last person vaccinated. If sufficient amount don't have the immunity, it becomes an endemic uh, that will continue for, for many a years. Yeah, the last mile is always the most difficult one. Uh, and uh, also, the um, uh, as you say, as long as this uh, virus is, is not under control everywhere, nobody is safe. So it really requires a global effort, every country in every community. And we know from experience from immunization programs, 
which are extremely successful in many countries, particularly in, in the region. Um, you know, they reach like 90, 95% sometimes of people, but then the last 5% can be in remote areas, can be uh, in poor populations and so on. And um, I know that immunization programs for children, they're now putting a lot of emphasis on reaching those. Um, and we'll need to do the same thing for um, COVID uh, immunization, but we, we can build on that experience. But as I said, this is going to be a vaccine in the first place for adults and older adults and not for children. And they're not used to be vaccinated. There's no, there's no program. So, this is it's well, a big it's mind a change, change a big mind shift yeah, it's in. a new challenge and you know we may have to join forces with you know uh, dealing with the, the programs for chronic diseases with diabetes cardiovascular disease and so on which are rampant in the region and um, right so maybe that's the way to do it. so i think we'll uh, we need to find solution though very very fast how how quickly i think there's two parts so one is definitely the solution for distribution and manufacturing and and i think the industry through chronic care is well positioned to figure out a distribution channel. The second element is that trust. Obviously, the sheer amount of information and in turn misinformation. I guess two areas to briefly touch upon is, do you feel campaigns such as the British Royals or the ex-president uh, getting vaccinated, does that really make a sufficient dent? Um, or of course, news around, uh, I guess, liabilities, um, emergency controls, maybe for the general population, what does emergency mean? And if, uh, if there are issues caught, how is it rolled back? And I guess if you can explain the safety measures that regulators maybe don't communicate well enough that are in place and why then there is more distrust or, or, or the issue of profit versus safety when the debate is more access and, and risk. Yeah, yeah, there's a really a mega effort in terms of communication is necessary. Um, Pharma in general is uh, not a very trusted uh, sector in many societies, big pharma to say so. Um, I think that's uh, recently has improved because they've come up you know, with products uh, to their credit, um, but also transparency issues. Uh, for example, the announcements of the efficacy of the vaccines has been made through press releases. Only yesterday uh, was the, the, the first publication uh, um, come out in the Lancet on the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine so that you can look at the data. So all that is not uh, to, uh, let's say, improve uh, confidence. Um, and so transparency, I think, is extremely important. But also, um, you have to understand why are people worried. And, uh, and when you think of, um, let's say, the, uh, the movement of vaccine hesitancy, you have a hardcore of, let's say, anti-vaxxers, people who don't want vaccines because they want it the natural way or whatever reason, or they think is a conspiracy of pharmaceutical industry, whatever um, government. That's, that's a hardcore group. But there are lots of people who are hesitant and who have these questions, which I think are legitimate. And that's where with information we can uh, achieve. But thinking, uh, uh, respecting their views, not, uh, you know, in, in the health sector or we medics, we often say, okay, they don't understand it. Let me explain to you. No, no, we first have to understand what, why is that? It's sometimes about something else. Uh, you know, we know that from other vaccines, it could be whatever, you want to sterilize my daughters because there is some political issue also. But also, um, um, role models can, be, can play a big role. And who these role models are, that change is different from society to society. Uh, and, and it can actually increase uh, the problem sometimes, you know, if you... Uh, if people get more paranoid about it. But I think right. it is important. And also in some societies like religious leaders being on board, are, it's very important. Um, and, uh, and we've seen that with other vaccine programs like for polio um, from right. various religions, that can be important. But also uh, in some societies, maybe a football star is more important than a royal, who knows? I, I, I'm not a specialist in this, but it's, <laughs> You, but it's important, your point, you know, of working with people who um, are trusted by the population. And if they see that he or she takes the vaccine and said, okay, it must be good. Um, but we should not then take any so shortcut. That is really important that we, uh, you know, that has case. And the CEOs of um, the major vaccine producers um, signed a declaration where they said exactly that because they were under quite political pressure, particularly in the US, 
uh, from President Trump, uh, uh, Trump out to uh, announce results or to accelerate that. And they said, we will not do that. Mm -hmm. We go for the science and we stick because also, honestly, if you think of it, if something goes wrong, the reputation of these companies, uh, you know, will be gone and uh, it will affect their business at all levels. So they can't afford to do that. Uh, if you look at it from, just from that perspective. Um, so, Professor, just uh, wrapping up shortly, I had uh, two final questions. Um, one, obviously, was a key takeaway or just a personal uh, thought from you for the future. But before that, uh, kind of a spirited debate, and this is purely subjective. Uh, do you ever feel that we'll reach a point um, in terms of vaccine mandates because of the severity of COVID? Or how long do you think that because of the watch, wait, see approach, because we don't know what the long-term impact is yet across populations, when do we get to that 80% herd immunity status? Is it three months, six months, one year, two years? And at what point do we get that trust level that people say, yes, we're okay with this becoming a recommended mandated process to, to be vaccinated? Maybe not mandated, but highly recommended, like much of the, the top 25 vaccines that are there for immunization. Yeah, I think the situation is uh, quite different from one country to another. Uh, I think in many countries there won't be a problem. People will say yes, because uh, there is trust uh, in government in the measures. I mean, think of the the difference between Southeast and East Asia in terms of the respect for even wearing masks and so on. You know, in, I know in Singapore, so data is over 95%. In Europe, it's like 60, 70%, uh, you know, in some countries even lower. Um, so that's one element, um, but um, I think people will also uh, be very pragmatic. I, I can imagine that in order to take a plane in the future, to uh, to visit, to, to travel, uh, you will be asked a vaccine certificate, probably a digital one, that's where we work. But uh, just as um, if you go to certain countries, uh, you need a yellow fever vaccine. And everybody accepts right. that because of the risk. So I think uh, maybe even to go to, uh, I don't know, big events, big sports events and so on. So, uh, so I don't think there will be a need in most societies to make it compulsory, but uh, the incentives will be such that people will want it. Uh, also, the mortality continues to grow, so more and more families know somebody or have somebody have that they lost. Personal connection to the virus. Yes, yeah, so it's real. It's very real. Um, it may be more difficult once it's under control and you don't, uh, and people don't, no longer die, and then we will have to continue to vaccinate probably. So, but that's uh, that's for next a few years from now. Uh, okay. Let's deal with it then. But I think that um, yeah, I'm more optimistic that that and, and but it should be no. part of the basic uh, vaccine and, and and public health measures. Understood. So, and I think let me end with this, which is. Like I said earlier, the, the sheer breadth and depth of impact has been immense, but equally just the way the communities come together, healthcare professionals, our research, yourself advising regulation government, it's been just surely inspiring and incredible. Um, for us looking forward, are there any key takeaways or just points that you'd like to, for us and, and everyone tuning into Medical Festival Asia, remember um, to be mindful of as we go into 2021? Well, every crisis has an opportunity. And the opportunity here was uh, unprecedented collaboration, as you said, the sharing of information. I remember in the SARS days, uh, information, the data were not shared and so on, and we wasted a lot of time. And here, it's all in the open. Um, industry and governments have come up to the challenge, but leadership will remain very important. We have to keep it up now, the measures, until there is a widespread vaccination with herd immunity. We can't relax at the moment. That is so, because we would pay a very high price. So uh, keep uh, the, the measures going until, um, you know, we're all safe. And then I said, be better prepared as societies for whatever comes next. But fantastic that uh, uh, you're doing this and um, I wish you a, um, a great festival. Mm -hmm. No, thank wish you. Thank you so much. Wish I would uh, be in the region. Hopefully sooner, sooner than later. But uh, again, thank you very much. I know how critical this time has been and all that is happening uh, in your region. So thank you for taking the time out and thank you everybody for tuning in today. Uh, we'll keep your advice in heart and really be cautious and mindful going forward. So 
Uh, thank you again, Professor, and uh, have a have a great day ahead and best of luck uh, for the, the many things coming up. Thank you, Arun. Nice to Take meet care. you. Bye. Bye.